been declared bankrupt. And it seems to answer many of the questions that we may have. And it's, 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 an, it's a, an audacious metaphor. Society is language. Not society is like language, but society is language. Now, who first thought of this? I, I understand, you know, from my friends who are linguists that Saussure first started to float that one. But I have an alternative explanation that perhaps goes to the root of what I'm trying to, to explain tonight. And there are two names that, in my opinion, and in this I'm not alone, I'm not originating this, I'm following, uh, uh, two names that truly revolutionized this uh, ambit. One is called Shakespeare, and the other is called Johnson, Dr. Johnson. William Shakespeare, Dr. Samuel Johnson. Harold Bloom wrote a book, published a book about 10 or 15 years ago called Shakespeare and the Invention, the Invention of the Human. And he's, wait a minute. Oh, Christ. Oh, here we are. I thought I better uh, quote what Bloom has to say. I join Johnsonian tradition, and I explain why this is important, in arguing nearly four centuries after Shakespeare that he went beyond all precedents and invented the human as we continue to know it. Shakespeare taught us to understand human nature, an experiential critic above all. Johnson knew that realities change, 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 industrial revolution, but this is 200 years before, 150 years before. Uh, where are we? Shakespeare taught us to understand knew that realities change, indeed are change, realities are change. What Shakespeare invents are ways of representing human changes, alterations not only caused by flaws and by decay, but affected by the will. Shakespeare unleashed the English language, uh, took the shackles and threw them away at a time when the first beginnings of utterances along the lines of we must standardize, we must uh, agree on a spelling, we must uh, set down rules, we must with luck have a dictionary. This is early days. Shakespeare messes up this possibility, but it doesn't die. And Jonathan Swift at the beginning of the, of the, 18th, the turn of the century writes a, a really robust essay, say we must have a Royal Academy of the English Language to determine how the English language must be used to fix the meaning of words. The French have it, the Italians have it, the Germans have it, we must have it. And there's a body of opinion in England that says, good idea, we really ought to do that. Fortunately, Dr. Johnson gets to hear of about this. And he says, in a way, over my dead body. He says, it's a terrible mistake to do this, although he was the author of the dictionary. In the preamble of the dictionary, if you read the preamble, he says, languages are alive and changing all the time. You cannot hold, try to hold them. It's a terrible mistake to do that. And he gives some wonderful examples. In a way, Shakespeare, according to Bloom, and I agree with him, and Dr. Johnson, according to himself, and I agree with him, precede Wittgenstein. Because Wittgenstein, facing a problem that resonates with this, is asked, what is the meaning of a word? What is the meaning of a thing? What is the meaning of a word? And he answers, meaning is usage. Meaning is usage. Now, at a time, this is, the industrial revolution is just beginning to happen when a language was required to respond to what was happening in society, England produces that language. And it is not a miracle, and it is not an accident, and it is not inexplicable that the lingua franca of the world is the English language. 
the, the English language is an enabling vehicle for what happened after the Glorious Revolution, what happened with the Industrial Revolution. Mr. Chairman, I said three factors that are deeply rooted in this country. And I'm responding to the preamble of this conference. I don't know whether it was uh, uh, Ron Manners or who wrote the first explanation there, where there's a reference to Captain Sterling. It says Captain Sterling. Andrew Pick. Oh, Andrew Pick. Well, spot on. Because uh, just to give a, a distant example, uh, I understand that Papua New Guinea and Hong Kong have about the same population. Now, well, this is, doesn't need much imagination. If you take the whole population of Hong Kong and bring it to Papua New Guinea, and the po population of Papua New Guinea put in Hong Kong, how long do you think Hong Kong is going to start looking like Papua New Guinea and vice versa? We are the carriers of culture. We are the carriers of culture. The history of Australia is one of the oldest histories on Earth. But it's not old because of uh, Ayers Rock or, or the Aboriginal uh, participation in things, you know, 40,000 years ago or whatever. No, it's old because it is the culture that originated, developed, was modified in England. I mean, how can you separate the creative individualism that flew from the Glorious Revolution inadvertently, that wasn't the object of the Glorious Revolution. How can one separate the processes of change that issued from uh, an industrial revolution that existed, that started far away from Canberra, far away from Westminster, and placed change at the heart of society? How can you take that away from Australia? How can you take the English language out of Australia? How can one ignore the fact that the lingua franca of the world is the English language and that there's no competitor? There's no competitor. It would need a really wild imagination to tell us this language is waiting, waiting. Any day now, it will become the lingua franca of the world. Which one? No, no competitors. And in the past, if history has anything to teach, is that that dimension of the thing, and I, some people call it imperialism, whatever, I would simply say that what now is shared by the English-speaking world and by much of the rest of the world as the lingua franca is unlikely to disappear very soon, number one. Number two, that the English language is a symbol of many other things that go with it, signifiers, like soccer, like every sport practically, like the largest and fastest growing industry in the world, which is the tourist industry invented by the English. But I could go on and on. I, I just learned that the two most popular social activities in China are volleyball and basketball. There are two inventions of the YMCA in Massachusetts in the 1890s. And the YMCA is an English entity invented in England. So it is very hard, in my opinion, to take modernity away from its English roots. And it is even harder to bypass Australia in that process. Is there, are there any shadows, are there any threats to this uh, rather optimistic uh, description. Yes, Mr. Chairman, to each of them. In the case of the Glorious Revolution and its unintended consequence of the blossoming of creative individualism, there is the process described by Professor Minogue in his servile mind, in which, and by several of the speakers today in the conference, by which we are uh, divesting ourselves willingly, we are being lured into doing this of personal responsibility for all sorts of things and passing these responsibilities to the central state. In other words, undoing what the Glorious Revolution, in the sense that I described it, managed to do. That's a threat. 
In the case of the Industrial Revolution, something like that also is occurring. We are divesting ourselves or allowing the central state to intrude in such a way that it takes away the incentive for us to assume risks and assume both the consequences or the rewards of, rewards of that risk. And we had at least two papers touching on this today. And in the case of the English language and the complex of culture that it represents, I am truly appalled to discover that there are universities in the English-speaking world where the study of English, English literature, has been discontinued. And it has been subsumed into something called communications or something like that. Now, it's n n n it, it, students are not studying. They're being severed from their own, from the mainstream of the cultural tradition. I mean, and it, it sounds like a bad joke. That's the study of English literature discontinued at Monash University in Melbourne. I, I could go on naming names, but this that happens to be very close to, <laughs> to me. Some of my friends, you know, are jumping up and down about it, but there it is. So in all three, there are challenges to what otherwise would have been regarded as the uh, sustaining factors of a success story. And uh, you may well ask, and I close now, what can we do about this? And I would say that uh, the disinclination of the English over the centuries for grand ideas, including royal academies of the language and things like that, it remains alive. So I have no idea whether a grand idea uh, may be part of the solution. But I do think that Edmund Burke really put his finger on it, and you fished <laughs> this spot on uh, suggestion <laughs> in your, in your descri description of the uh, Western uh, Civilization uh, booklet when you reminded us about the little platoons. I think the little platoons is a good direction to follow. And the, to multiply the little platoons is perhaps the best way that we can begin to defend something that is immensely worth defending. And if this conference is an indication of the mood uh, affecting, of the mood shared by cultivated human beings uh, in this country, we are, uh, we are justified in feeling decisively optimistic about the outcome. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much.